Today on Chainlinked, we'll talk to Michael Kong from Phantom to learn more about their growing DeFi ecosystem powered by Chainlink Oracles. Plus, are you considering a career in blockchain? Ben Wu from the Chainlink Labs careers team is on to talk about how to land a job building Chainlink or other parts of the smart contract industry. Chainlinked is a pocket-sized podcast series looking at the many applications of Chainlink blockchain oracles across global enterprise, the blockchain industry, and emerging tech projects. We break down the news and frame Chainlink technical innovations and integrations for any listener. My name is Dr. Andy Boyan. You can call me Andy, and I'll be your host. I love talking to people working on blockchain projects, especially when they've integrated Chainlink oracles. There's something special about watching a vibrant ecosystem grow that much more once their developers can access data via Chainlink. So today I brought on Michael Kong from Phantom to talk about their recent integration and what it means for the Phantom chain. Michael, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me. I appreciate you being here and it's nice to meet you in person. Yeah, great to be here. And thank you very much for inviting me. I I do really appreciate it. Well, I mean, the timing was really great. Phantom just integrated Chainlink natively last week. And so why not come on and talk about it? awesome opportunity for my audience to learn more about Phantom as well. So what's special about Phantom? Like, give us the elevator pitch. What's special about Phantom, I think, is the underlying technology and also the community. So we have, I think, a really fast consensus that's based on ABFT. So that's asynchronous consensus. So it allows us to confirm transactions very fast. So usually we can confirm transactions in approximately one second because it's scalable as well the transaction fees can be quite low as well. So transaction fees are usually around like a couple of cents or so. And so the user experience just makes it a lot easier for people to interact with applications, for people to develop on applications. Mm -hmm. And also with the community, we have a core group of like very loyal community members Mm -hmm. from all around the world. And they really have been supporting fandom for actually, some of them actually since almost from the beginning. And they provide a lot of feedback on what we're doing you know, sometimes they're very critical, which I, I do appreciate. I think helps us become a better ecosystem. And they're always keen to give suggestions and, and to launch projects on Phantom and, and really just help us out. Something else you said is about user experience. Your like base wallet and DeFi stuff is really well designed. Like it, It's pretty intuitive. You guys do a lot of work on UI as well. Having a great user experience is absolutely critical. And that's actually what we mean by time to finality. So time to finality is concept of how long does it take for a transaction Mm -hmm. to be finalized in the chain? And the fact that we can do it approximately one second on average means that the user doesn't have to sit and wait for the transactions to be confirmed. They don't have to wait for six or so number of blocks afterwards to really make sure that it's confirmed Mm -hmm. because of the way the consensus works. As soon as you get one confirmation, that's enough. And so that's really uh, critical for user experience. And of course, when it comes to user experience, you need to have great applications that are very intuitive and and easy to use. And so what we've tried to do, for example, like with our Phantom wallet, is just try and put all the essential features that you need in a wallet, interacting with different applications, of course, sending, creating wallets and maintaining wallets all in a single place. So for us, user experience is probably like close to number one. Because if you don't have Mm -hmm. great user experience, it doesn't matter how great the underlying technology is, people aren't simply going to want to use the technology because it will just be too hard to use. And so making things as easy and as simple as possible for users to use is what really matters to us. Does speed change the way that people are actually using the platform? So like I'm thinking of automation and, and bots, like if people have, you know, trading algorithms or things like that, or whatever it is that they happen to use, speed enables some of that. Are you seeing like different types of activities that people are trying on Phantom with high speed, low fees? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to give an example, we've got a few projects that are running um, automatic market makers or AMMs, and they compound, for example, one of the projects compounds apparently once every 15 minutes, and it can probably do it a lot more frequently than that. So you've got like continuous automatic compounding going on. Having lower fees and a great user experience is critical for getting the mass of users that we want not just like a select group or anything like that. There are many amazing features about DeFi, and and that's just one of them. In a traditional finance setting, something like this just isn't possible by a user because there are brokers involved, there are a lot of middlemen involved, it becomes prohibitively expensive. On the blockchain, you can do all of this stuff yourself where the code is basically your middleman. The, The code just executes it for you. And if the code is done correctly, there's no middleman, the fees can be extremely low, and you're in control of your funds the whole time. So this is why DeFi is getting really big And it's something that's grown tremendously on Phantom. 
And it's something that's just growing overall across the whole ecosystem because of, of features like that. Phantom integrated Chainlink to be another part of that infrastructure that provides security, provides transparency, allows greater decentralization for all these apps that are creating smart contracts on Phantom and letting people access these things. I was browsing through the ecosystem of applications that are in dApps that are coming on Phantom or that are already on Phantom. And you guys have a ton of stuff, a bunch of which are already using Chainlink on other chains. So I feel like it's a, a really nice match for you guys to add Chainlink. Of course, there's demand for that as people already use them and hopefully many more dApps. What kind of growth have you guys been seeing with the ecosystem? What kind of apps are coming online? The only thing that we're missing were the Chainlink price feeds. So having the price feeds there means that it would help the ecosystem grow tremendously. We're seeing a lot of tremendous growth on chain. We've seen a large numbers of projects come in to the Phantom ecosystem. We're now seeing NFT projects start being deployed on the Phantom ecosystem. And I think what's very encouraging is from time to time, quite often, somebody messages me and says, hey, there's this new project deployed on, on the Phantom ecosystem. And it's happening organically where people are just cool. you know looking at the chain themselves and saying, wow, let's start developing on it. That's open source, right? That's why you do open source. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's, it's like a wonderful feeling. You're like, oh, like it's so great that people are just organically launching things on chain and, you know, technology is open source. So we look at it and other people can look at it. And, it, you know, it's a very, I think, open community. And, and that's what I really love about blockchain communities. That's what I really love about the internet and DeFi and, and all of that. You guys have this great focus on bridges as well, obviously, to connect into these other ecosystems. I'm wondering... If you look at Ethereum and DeFi and Ethereum, it succeeded not just because it's the oldest, but because it's also the largest network. And if you think about network effects, the more people and users you have, the more value. That's sort of the model. And so by building bridges to other chains, it's not mm -hmm. just moving value from one chain to another. It's growing the network, which means growing the potential network effects. That is exactly right. You're 100% right. I mean, in the end, it's all about traction. It's all about network effects because someone I know really, really well used to always tell me that if you just have great technology and nothing else, then it's a science project. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool and interesting, but if nobody uses it, then it's just a science project. So I think we have decent technology and, and technology that we're continuing to improve on. But for it to really matter, we need people to use it. And so that's why, back to your original question you asked me, user experience is definitely a big focus for us. User experience on the web application side, on the GUI side, and then also on the performance side is absolutely critical for us to be able to achieve network effects because it needs to be an ecosystem that, that really works and is as easy as possible for people to use. I don't know if I can summarize it better than that, Mike. I think that's our, our clincher right there. Thanks for coming on, dude. Yeah, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, I really do appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity. The Web3 industry is hiring. Blockchain and smart contract projects are seeing this massive acceleration in adoption and interest, so projects need more capable people to work in the industry. Chainlink Labs is no exception, of course. But I see many questions about working in Web3, so I brought Ben Wu from the Chainlink Labs careers team on to talk about what kinds of opportunities are available, what the general careers outlook for Web3 is, and what people, if you haven't worked in Web3 or blockchain, what you can do to stand out as an applicant. Hey, Ben, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. It's nice to talk to you on the podcast. We chat here and there, but it's nice to bring you on. Yeah, thanks for featuring me. Excited to be a part of this. I like talking to the careers team at Chainlink Labs. You guys have a really different perspective on what's happening in the industry. It's like you're you're out in the world with people who are, are they coming in? Are they you know trying to decide what to do and where they fit in? So you guys tend to have a really interesting perspective. Maybe you find somebody who's stellar, but you're not exactly sure if they fit a job description. So you've got to do some of this like, where could we hire them? Because they're amazing. So we want to bring them in. What can they do? Do you do a lot of that? Yeah, definitely. I think that because blockchain is so nascent, sometimes we come across absolute superstars who might not know exactly where they're going to fit into the org. And so I think that's the importance of having a diverse interview panel and being able to give them exposure to different parts because as they go through the interview cycle, it helps us and them calibrate where they might fit best. But oftentimes, a lot of the skill sets are pretty adjacent to different roles that we have. So we like to keep things pretty flexible, especially for someone that might not fit exactly what the role they're applying to is. What kinds of opportunities are available? What are people hiring for? Is it all developers? Is it all engineers? What's going on? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, you know, if you were trying to get into the space a couple of years ago, it was very developer centric. You had to be pretty technical to break in. But what we've witnessed over the past year and a half is the traditional careers you would find at a software as a service company are starting to appear within crypto. 
So for example, we're hiring for account executives, solutions architects, sales engineers, and those are typically roles that you'd only find at a traditional tech company. But across the board, there are a lot more opportunities for non-technical folks to break into the space if they're interested. Is there still the demand for technical people? Has that changed at all? If that's changed, it's only gone up, right? So I think across the board, whether it's technical or non-technical, the opportunities are much, much more broad for people who are trying to break into the space. So it's not like it's shifted from technical to non-technical. It's that technical need has increased in demand. And now these sort of less technical roles, I'm not going to say non-technical because there is you know, some understanding of the industry. How much insight does somebody coming into Web3 have to have on the industry and the technology to be able to work in the space, do you think? Yeah, good question. So, you know, it's very role contingent, right? So I think if we're talking about being a sales rep, you don't have to know how to program in Solidity. But if you're going to interview with, let's say, Chainlink Labs and in a conversation with you, you should probably be able to speak to a couple of projects that you're excited about, be able to define the value proposition and be able to discuss some industry trends at a high level. So you're right, maybe non-technical isn't the right description, but I would say that you have to be able to understand the value that the space is bringing and understand the types of users who are participating in the community. The way that go-to-market teams are usually structured is they'll have an account executive who is more of the business person that understands how to pitch the value of the product, and then you'll have more technical solutions architect or sales engineer to step in to actually help them scope and walk them through integrations into the platform. So there's a kind of a mix for everybody. If you're less technical and you want to just you know talk to customers and pitch, there's a room for you. If you're more technical and you want to be more hands-on with the actual coding, there's also an opportunity for you as well. What about like leadership roles and, and sort of executive or director level? If somebody's been in enterprise in Web2 or some other industry, but they have VP experience, did those skills translate over to Web3? Yeah, yeah. And again, I think it's also depending on the types of opportunities they're going for. But for example, the senior leadership that we have on the go-to-market team on the sales and business development side, we have a couple of leaders who made career transitions from ad tech and from traditional SaaS. And for them, the reason they were a good fit is because a lot of the skill sets you have as a leader, being able to manage a team, build out a playbook and run a go-to-market motion is basically the same whether you're doing that in Web 2 or Web 3. Really for the Web3 experience, if they were a hobbyist and they did their due diligence to really understand the space, all of the other skills roll over pretty well because at the end of the day, it's still pretty much the same role in a different industry. Here's a question. If I'm an applicant, if I'm looking at Chainlink Labs or another Web3 company, but I don't have Web3 experience or blockchain industry experience, what do I do on my application, whether it's in a letter or in a call or in a resume, what do I do to stand out? Yeah, for sure. And I can actually bring up a real life example because I always love bringing up people who enter Chainlink Labs with an unconventional background. So Mark Romero, one of our community leads out of Barcelona, who manages our Hispanic community, he started off as a guy who spent 20 years working for a family business, helping with building restoration projects, right? Not exactly the resume that I'd be looking for as a recruiter, Mm -hmm. but he was a hobbyist from the outside who applied for an advocate program and volunteered his time for about eight months, helping us build the community, organize events, and engage with different users online. Because he proved out value, we gave him a contract role to help us out with some lightweight recruiting work. And after doing that for a few months, we finally offered him a full-time role as a community lead out of Barcelona. And so what Mark's takeaway from there is he was somebody who participated in the community And really, like, it's a bit cheesy for me to say, but I call it proof of work Mm -hmm. in that if you go into the community, you add value, you're engaging with users, and you build a reputation for yourself, that's much more valuable than just your experience on paper, because you'll actually have people who vouch for you, who can speak to the work ethic and speak to your understanding of the space. And there's almost an annoying persistence with some people in the community who don't have the traditional backgrounds, because they know that they almost have to prove themselves a little bit more. And so Mark's a great example of somebody who was completely outside of industry, but managed to land a full-time gig with us. Yeah, Mark's awesome. Hey, Mark, shout out to you. Ben, as we wrap up here, what are some of the top roles at Chainlink Labs that you guys are emphasizing hiring right now? Yeah, you know, I think the most exciting opportunities for us are the product management positions. So we have a couple of product lines that we're looking to support, whether that be verified randomness, keepers, cross-chain, and market price and data. And so these PMs will oversee solutions that will scale to millions and potentially billions of users, which as a product manager, you always want to work on something that operates at a pretty large scale. Mm -hmm. And so I think the PM roles are, are particularly exciting at this time. Yeah. And I think the thing that you'll realize with a lot of people here is that when 
you come to Chainlink Labs, it's of course you're working, but there's a sense that there's really a mission orientation about what, like changing the world, being able to build the protocol for Web 3.0 and being able to affect so many industries with total addressable market caps that span trillions of dollars. This is an opportunity that you just won't find at a traditional tech company. That's a great place to end. Ben, thanks for coming on and talking about careers. Where can people go if they're interested in taking a look at careers at Chainlink? So you can go to chainlinklabs.com slash careers. And there you'll see open opportunities for everything from go-to-market, legal, operations, and finance. And if there's not a role available, connect with me on LinkedIn and let's have a chat because I'm always open to opportunistic conversations for exceptional people. All right. We'll make sure it includes a link to that in the post so people can find it. Ben, thanks for coming on, man. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Peace. Thanks for listening and being part of the Chainlink community. Now, please help me grow Chainlink to podcast and the entire Chainlink ecosystem. Subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast. It helps the algorithm spread Chainlink and the Chainlink ecosystem to more crypto curious people. Next, follow me and Chainlink today on Twitter. I'm at Andy Boyan, and you can get updates on the podcast and many more articles at Chainlink today. There are friends helping distribute the pod. Finally, join the official Chainlink Discord and Telegram communities. Many community members, including myself, hang out there, so you can chat with me about what you want to hear more of on Chainlink. Again, thank you for supporting the podcast by listening. I'll catch you next time. Bye.